you join me today at the wheel of a Rover 216 convertible. Not just any 216 convertible, but my Rover 216 convertible, it's Quentin. And yes, I've actually finally taken the roof down. Hello, welcome to Furious Driving Goes for a Drive and to the very occasional series Goes for a Drive in one of my own cars. Yes, today we are actually taking Quentin, the Rover 216 SE convertible, for a drive. Now, this isn't the first time we've had a Rover R8 on the channel and trust me, it won't be the last. In fact, it's not even the first time we've had a Rover 200 convertible on here. But the last time it was a Rover 214 and this is a somewhat posher 216 in SE form, no less. So shall we see how it stacks up? Now, I won't bore you with the full minutian history of the Rover R8 history. If you'd like to deep dive into some of that and check in some of the previous videos on the Tourer, the Coupe, the Saloon, the other convertible, basically this is the Mark II Rover 200. It was the Mark I was the SD3, the Mark II was the R8. They were developed in conjunction with Honda. Honda got the Ballard, Rover got the R8 200 slash 400 series. Honda, on the one hand, didn't do a lot with the platform. They just did a couple of different body styles. Rover, though, went all out to get the maximum they could from it. They did the saloon, the hatch in five door and three door, they did the estate, they did the coupe, they did the cabrio which we have here. Now the R8 200 appeared in 1989 to critical acclaim. The magazines and reviewers of the time basically said it trounced your position, it outhandled the Fiat, it was better equipped and better built than the Ford. It was the one to buy and it was a huge seller for Rover. But initially it was just the three and five door hatchbacks. The convertible didn't appear for another couple of years until 1993. But it is clear that a convertible was in the offing from the very beginning of the project because there are photos of styling bucks, clay model cars, full size convertibles dating back to 1988 before the model launch. So we know that the convertible and even the coupe were in their game plan from the very beginning. So what happened? Well, basically they cut the roof off a three door car effectively. This is quite interesting. We park various R8 Rover 200s and 400s away from each other, they look like they're very different sizes. The convertible looks quite small, the coupe looks very low and sleek, and the hatchback just looks different size altogether. But the 200s, apart from, well, the Estate 400, are all the same length, they're the same car underneath, and so many of the panels are shared. Obviously, to make a convertible, they have had to strengthen under the floor. And in this particular case, they've decided to go with a Targa bar, a rollover hoop in the center of the car to aid rigidity of the structure, so you don't get too much scuttle shake. Now, for the most part, things have not been changed from the rest of the car, so they've managed to keep production costs down by having the same bonnet, same lights, bumpers, that kind of thing. But there are a few choice changes. Notably, the coupe and the convertible have a slightly different wing shape, so you can't put coupe and convertible wings onto the hatches and the saloons and things. However, the coupe and the convertible are actually slightly different at the bottom because the coupe has got a plastic finisher that sits down here, which the convertible doesn't. So the bottom of this metal panel is different. So if you happen to be looking for a replacement wing, you have to make sure it's a replacement for a convertible. Around the back of the car, they've done as much as they can to keep on using parts bin parts as well to keep the costs down. Same rear lights, same rear bumper as they can in other models. Uh, same fuel filler cap, I believe. But the rear quarter panel is unique to the convertible. And although this trim finisher is the same as on the rest of the, the entire range, pretty much, the boot lid looks like it'll flip over to a coupe, but I don't think it actually will. Obviously, the hood is unique to the convertible. Now you may be saying, why am I still sitting here with the hood up? And I'm gonna tell you, it looks flipping awesome. This car in the silver and red combination looks absolutely fantastic. And I do think it looks better with the roof up than the roof down. If you ask really, really nicely, I'll put the roof down in a minute. First of all though, let's look in the boot. Now, the rest of the Rover 200 and 400 range have got that typically Japanese thing of, there's a key to open the boot and there's a tag by the driver's foot so you can pull a tag to open the boot and you can pull a tag to open the fuel cap. They felt though in the convertible, it was a security risk to have that tag down by your foot. So they removed it, which means the only way to get into the boot of this car is the key. So do not lock yourself out of here because I can tell you it's not easy to break into the boot. I have broken into the boot and it's not easy. I'm gonna put this back in my pocket now so I don't forget it and shut it in there. Now the floor area of the boot is the same size as the rest of the three and five door hatchbacks and the coupe and everything else. However, your access, because of this bit of metal here, is severely limited. This is 
basically the same as on the coupe so you've got a letterbox to get in here it goes back a long way and the seats do fold down so you can get a fair bit of stuff into the boot if you want to now underneath this floor is a full-size spare wheel and your toolkit and interestingly on most of the rest of the 200 range the fuel pump is in the top of the tank on this side the driver's side on a right-hand drive car with an access panel above it on the convertible cars the fuel pump is on the left-hand side with no access panel above it ask me how i know keys are in my pocket now there was a mild facelift in 1994 a few cosmetic changes most notably the thing that grabs people when they see the car is it got a grill back previous to that it was a flat front on the bonnet with just a slat and an opening to let air through then it got this retro style grill to tie in the style of the rest of the rover range and then of course the entire range was discontinued in 1995 to make way for the new bubble rover which was all new apart from the fact that a lot of it was carried over from this car so even though the rest of the R8 range was discontinued in 1995, the niche models continued until 1999. That is the coupe, the estate, and this, the convertible. But because the donor car was no longer there to give the dashboard moulding, these cars now got the Rover 200 bubble shaped dashboard this soft molded thing which is all very curvaceous and lovely and bubbly fitting with the style very much of the new um, r3 bubble 200 but of course it is completely at odds with the very square edge styling of the r8 however they've done a great job to integrate it and make it not look at all out of place and if you didn't know there was a very very square 1980s dashboard that had been here just months previously you'd never know let me grab you off the tripod and show you around. Now down here in the floor, as I mentioned earlier, we've only got the fuel filler. We haven't got the boot opener peg down here, which is unique to the um, convertibles. And also, because we're in the SE fancy one, we've got an adjuster for the seat height. So the doors really haven't changed from the rest of the R8 range of 200s. Uh, you have a large molded uh, kind of plasticky cover, which is sort of soft touch, elephant hide. You've got the big door speaker, big door pull, Electric windows with one touch on the driver's side, not on the passenger sadly. Nice metal door handle and if it's a leather interior then you do get a nice leather insert otherwise it's in the same fabric as the rest of the car. Now moving over to the bubble dashboard, nothing's really changed it's just the way it's all housed is a little bit different now. The biggest difference really is we now have an airbag on the passenger side which wasn't a thing before in the old square ones, Not certainly not an integrated one that looked part of the dashboard. Up top we have got a nice bit of wood veneer insert and a clock next to that which is the same clock just in a rounder housing the t-shelf though has gone this is sad sad times indeed where there was once one of the greatest t-shelves in automotive history there is now a curvaceous swathe of elephant hide uh, soft touch plastic it actually is soft touch you can squish your fingers into it just very slightly uh, we've got air vents left center and to the right and plus little extra air vents blowing up onto the windows to keep you defrosted and uh, vision clear at all times the binnacle which has become obviously rounder like in the bubble rover uh, but the instruments are still the same there's a case of if it ain't broke don't fix we've got no money to do that so we have got the same very very clear instruments in this particular car we've got just the same four as always uh, water temperature fuel outside rev counter and speedo in the middle and this car's only done 83 miles in its 25 years on this earth pulling back from that we've got exactly the same instruments as ever the uh, nice honda sourced stalks which last forever and have a lovely tactile click when you move through the controls wipers likewise on the right hand side the steering wheel is now an airbag wheel on the earliest cars obviously it wasn't because that wasn't a thing the horn i think it's horns a little ill that <laughs> should sound better than that and this does have the volume and channel controls dangling from below which is a newer mid 90s facelift refresh item again the earliest cars didn't get that down to the right hand side of the wheel we've got these panel switches which have partially moved because previously there was a panel up here on the pre-facelift cars which had buttons for electric sunroof or for the in this case electric hood but the mirror switch i think was always down here by your knee on the left hand side of the wheel on the pre-facelift cars matching the right hand side there were three more buttons for hazard lights rear screen heater fog lights that kind of thing so yeah this panels of buttons which you couldn't really see too clearly have now moved over here to the center these are the rear fogs if it had front fogs that would be just there but this bumper design doesn't have space for fogs in it can't even retrofit them we have exactly the same controls that we always had same heating ventilation and as ever and with the wonderful face level vent thingamajigs which are absolutely glorious but now in a nice bit of wood and in this nice surround 
below that we were getting quite nice radios at the time this one's not completely fitted because it's halfway out because it needs to be sent off for a, a cutting out on the move glitch so this car will probably shortly have a sony in it again uh, we have got a 12 volt and an ashtray and below that we have got our rather useful cassette holders over to the left and below the airbag we have got a pretty decently sized um, glove box in there a little bit plasticky to be honest and moving back from the center console we have got our five speed manual gearbox an auto was an option but why would you behind that we have got a manual handbrake what looks like it could be a blanking plate for a switch which isn't there but no that's just hiding the screws that hold this panel down and then we have a cubby hole because this car is leather trimmed this is leather topped as well now this car does have rather wonderful leather seats in it the beautiful tan beige some people think it looks gray on camera but in real life it's it's kind of halfway in between it's it's either gray with a hint of tan beige or it's beige with a hint of gray take your pick really <laughs> on the doors in the light over there where the plastic's faded a bit it is definitely far more brown more beige than it is gray so i think it's meant to be beige right let's take a look in the back flip the seats forward and clamber in watch your head on the t-bar and this is strictly a two-seater look at these bucket seats here there really is no way of getting a third person in the center because there just isn't room for them there is an inertia reel seat belt on both sides for both people so it is properly restrained but that it really is all you get manual windows in the back i don't think electric windows were ever an option on this for the rear of the car oh, you do get a big loudspeaker the audio in this car is actually really good someone has actually replaced the original speakers with some aftermarket good ones jbl or something i think and uh yeah looking forward we do have our our bar with grab handles and curtsy light and looking at the seat belts this is the thing that cars don't seem to have anymore i don't know why you can change the height of your shoulder belt in the front now when you're in the back here uh it looks like it might be a bit cramped on your head but I'm actually sitting here and I'm quite comfortable. I'm, I'm about the right size for these bucket seats. I, I kind of fit in them relatively well. And headroom wise, on my hat, I think is like a centimeter or so, two, maybe three centimeters. I oh, know, just touching. If I sit, stretch my back, I can touch. Otherwise, I'm just all right. And I've got a fairly good amount of elbow room because there's only two of us here in the back. But this bench, you'll note, is actually quite a lot narrower than it would be on the regular hatchback car because they've had to make room for all this assembly of. Um, the gubbins that makes the roof go up and down. I'm gonna have to do it, aren't I? I'm gonna have to put the roof down now. I have never put the hood down on this car in the two months or so since the hood's been done. I haven't done it. I know it works, they've tested it several times up at Car Hood Warehouse where they fitted it, but I was not wanting to, I don't, I've got this weird feeling I'm gonna mark the back window if I fold it down or something, but I know I won't. Right, we better do this thing. All right, so I've got the engine running because that's what you need to do. Put the windows down in the back drop the door windows a bit undo these bits here and we are good to go push the button and see what happens oh let's see how this goes hang on i know it works so i'm not surprised i'm just uh oh, i don't want to mark my back window because it's beautiful Can you tell I'm a bit paranoid about the roof? <laughs> well, that's the first time I've done that. It does have a tonneau cover in the boot. Shall we see if I can make that fit as well? This is another first for me. I've not put the tonneau cover on since I've had the roof done. I did try and use it when the hood was broken to stop dirt getting in there. So I've got poppers at the front. <clears throat> and then the back end slams into the boot apparently. Well, there are more poppers. Down here, oh yeah, there we go. On this rear panel, there we go. Well, it's not as easy as an MX-5, but it's not difficult either. And then we can just tuck that behind there. And what do you go? We've got ourselves quite a tidy convertible there. Now, 
ironically if you like this is how I've basically seen this car for most of the time I've owned it for the first nine months to a year of the time I had it we had no hood frame on it then we had no fabric on the hood so it was down with the tonneau cover on it and so this is kind of taking me back but this is the first time I've seen it hood down with the new paint and the new wheels and new Falcon tires on it so this is all a big it's an improvement it's like looking at the car when it was new it's quite a big improvement but we're talking about the styling and the design of the car well, we'll just mention how good this thing still looks it's aged incredibly well it was designed quite conservatively and that kind of has helped it not become a victim of fashion because it's just an elegant shape that has grown good looking with age if you like it's matured like a fine wine or a cheese or r8 the cheese rover it was designed by Roy Axe, who was a bit of a legend of British car design. Did hundreds, thousands even, of, of different vehicles, probably. Um, we did a lot, certainly. And they were all nice, balanced designs. He was a great designer. He set the design style in stone for the R8 range back in the late 80s. But it does look good, doesn't it? Although, I still think it looks better with the roof up. <laughs> There are two things to look at under this bonnet. First of all, a K-Series 1.6, that's 1590ccs. Secondly, I forgot to detail the engine bay when I was doing the rest of the outside of the car. I'll get back to that soon, I promise. The K-Series was a massive investment for Rover. They spent 250 million pounds developing this engine back in the 1980s. And the Thatcher government wanted them to bin it as part of the Honda deal, but uh, the MD of Rover said no we want to keep our engine rightly so they spent a lot of money on it and managed to argue that they could the first of the R8s came with a 1.4 litre K-series and there was a 1.6 from Honda but by the mid 90s the 1.6 Rover was here under the bonnet making about 122 horsepower The 0-60 time on the 216 SE was about 9.5 seconds, 9.2 maybe, which is not astonishingly fast, but, you know, it's a convertible. You're in it for the nice ride, not for the performance. If you wanted the fast one, you'd have bought the coupe with the 2-litre. And the ride is soft. It doesn't roll too badly, but you do feel it is quite a soft, gentle ride. Being an R8, it does grip nicely. It's got good traction through the corners, even though there is a little bit of body flex that you can feel. Now, something I've done to this car is to change the tires to these new Falcon Zeons, which apparently are much quieter with some kind of foam lining inside them, uh, which actually does make the car really, really quiet on the road. There's a lot of wind noise, which doesn't help by having two GoPros up on the top scuttle. That makes it very loud indeed. But that aside, the engine is lovely and smooth. The 216 or the 1.6 K-Series is a great unit. It really does pack a fair bit of punch and is willing to rev. And the ride is lovely and smooth. It, the R8 is good. Rover's engineers were the ones behind the handling of this car. They, did, they put a lot of the character into these rather than the Honda engineers at the other end. And so it does handle really nicely. It's designed for the luxury end of the market rather than the sport end of the market. And that does suit the, um, the nature of the convertible. And the Rover engineers had to argue with Honda not to do their traditional very low scuttle and very low window line because the look of the car was all wrong. So Rover managed to persuade them to go for a slightly higher belt line, which means the glass area is a little smaller. And when it comes to the convertible conversion, that means the look of the thing is significantly improved. Actually, the proportions work absolutely perfectly. Because when you lock the planned metal roof off a car, it's very easy to mess up the shape and the proportion of the vehicle completely. Now for some people there really is no other way of driving than with the roof off. For me, it's not necessarily my bag, but I can see the appeal. It's so that GoPro is never really noisy over my head. I can see the appeal if it's got the right weather and the right car. And Rover were becoming a bit of a niche manufacturer uh, when they were sort of just filling in every little pigeonhole they could with the coupe, the estate car, and the convertible. And they did a good job of it. Their, their stylists were good, the engineers were good. So you're getting a decent package, electric windows, a power hood, power steering, power brakes. Although, despite the fact the car is kind of heavier than standard, obviously because of all the extra bracing under the floor to make it stay as stiff as it needs to be. 
and of course all the weight of all the machinery in the back of it to make the roof go up and down, which is actually surprisingly heavy. It's only got discs at the front and drums at the rear. The more sporting coupe got discs at the back as well. Now these are not a great survivor. Uh, going by the various figures I've heard, there's anywhere between 30 and maybe 90 of these cars left, so it's pretty safe to say there's about 50 of them on the road still, which is astonishingly small survival rate. It really is a rare car to find, especially in good condition because Rover R8s weren't massively killed by terrible, terrible rust, but they did suffer with rust in the arches and rust in the sills, not to a particularly great degree, but if your car is only worth a couple of hundred pounds and it needs a couple of hundred pounds worth of welding, chances are you're not going to pay the money, you'll scrap it. That finished off an awful lot of the 200s and 400s. And when it came to the convertibles, they suffered the same things with you know, rusty sills and arches, but also the hoods. If the hoods failed, it's about a thousand pounds to fix a hood basically from scratch. A hood fabric is about 500 pounds. Fitting a hood fabric is about 500 pounds. So if the hood goes, you're into the car for a grand. Again, if the car's worth less than a thousand pounds, who's going to do that unless they absolutely love it? So very few survive. So. Good cars were broken for the hoods, cars with only very minor rust were broken for the hoods, or cars with failed hoods were just broken. It's only now that we're getting to the critically endangered level that there are people willing to spend money on these cars and the values of them are starting to rise quite a lot. I've seen them for sale for seven or eight thousand pounds. KGF Classics have got a black one with about 35,000 miles on it for sale for five grand. So when you get into, and it's not huge money still, but it is some money, it's worth spending that thousand pounds to bring your car back up to a good condition again. <clears throat> In this case, this was a 100 pound car that needed a lot doing to it. Was I insane restoring it? Well, I don't know, because the car is now worth basically what I spent on it. It's worth approximately 4,000 pounds, give or take a bit. Depends how generous someone's feeling on the day. But I've now got an absolutely lovely car, which just needs a few tiny, tiny finishing touches for me to get onto at some point over the weekend and make this thing finished. But just look at this thing in the sunshine. The sparkling refurb wheels, the sparkling paint, that red hood. This car looks astonishingly good. So what's this thing actually like to drive? Well, it's like driving a Rover 200 really, but a bit more drafty when the roof's off. When the hood's up, it's really very composed indeed. It's a great hood, it's three layers thick. You've got a headliner, an interliner, and the outer thick fabric, or in this case, a, like a vinyl-y stuffed hood, which means you've got very little wind noise. And this is one of the few cars I own that's over 20 years old that doesn't leak, incredibly. On the road, it's really good. It's nice and stable. The steering is nicely weighted. There was an interesting new system they developed for this car back in the 80s, which was effectively turned off the power steering when you're going straight ahead and added increasing assistance as you decreased speed. So you've got a fair degree of feel through the steering wheel when you're going through the corners. Rover 200s were good handling cars. They had McPherson struts at the front and trailing arms at the rear meant they did stick to the road incredibly well. Now I've driven convertible 200s before and there's always an element of scuttle shake. The first time I drove this I was amazed at how little scuttle shake this car had. It feels really well screwed together. I don't know if being a 1995 car with the bubble dash that means it's got more bracing in the dashboard so it's got a little bit more of a stronger bulkhead and scuttle area. So that's a distinct possibility because like you can throw this around a corner and chuck it through a roundabout and it grips and doesn't flex incredibly badly. Now something else which is notable is how well everything on this car works. All the switches work, they've still got a nice solid click to them. from these door cards which I've taken off and mislaid the screws so there is a little bit of a rattle from these doors everything else is solid and rattle free the plastics are good it feels like really nice high quality stuff there's a lot of Honda in this Rover if a uh, Rover donated know-how in making a car handle and package Honda donated an awful lot of know-how in screwing them together 
strike you as an insight. That's the most battered insight I think I've ever seen. Now you may have seen this bridge in previous videos well, quite a few times, but it is a fantastic new bit of road they've built. It's like a test track. Unfortunately, other people are allowed to use it as well, which is a bit of a shame. Now I did contemplate lowering this car because I do think it looks like it's sitting a little bit high. But I'm glad I didn't because the ride is just cushiony soft. It's not wallowy or rolly. It's just nice. It floats through the corners. There's a little bit of roll because it is a softly sprung car, but it's sprung for comfort. Now the rivals to this car at the time were offerings like the Peugeot 306 convertible, the Renault 19 convertible, even the Ford Escort convertible. Now, certainly it was a better bet than the Escort, which does feel very floppy on the road. But out of the three, if I was going shopping for one in 1997 or so, would I go for the Rover? I think I've said previously I'd probably go for the Peugeot, but I don't know. The Rover does have a nicer interior, I think. It does lack that Gallic charm and style. So although it's only 9.6 to 60, it does still feel quite brisk and that 1.6 litre engine is quite a willing unit. It's really quite happy to, to rev away and it's nice and refined as well. This is one of the K-Series' great strong points. Uh, lots of power for, the, for the, the size of the thing and also very efficient too. It was originally developed as a lean burn thing. So, so rather than going the catalytic converter route, lean burn meant that you just used less fuel in the first place. Although the, uh, the catalytic converter thing was kind of foisted on the public and the, the motoring industry by the government in the end. So K-Series was best of both worlds. Thank you for joining me at the wheel of, well, my own car once again for those rare occasions and actually driving Quentin with the roof down deliberately for the first time. Admittedly, I drove it a lot with the roof down for the first uh, nine months or so because there's no other option. Now I can do whichever one I please. And it is fantastic to have this choice of rovers at home. I can go for the fast coupe, or I can go for the comfy, refined, elegant convertible. If you've enjoyed this, then do please hit the like and subscribe buttons and join me again next time driving something completely different. Mm -hmm.